finish it. Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, good evening. Thanks for coming to the talk. Um, so I'm just going to leave this. So this is a much uh, wider selection of uh, of this series, this body of work. I'm just going to leave it there. Yeah. So um, okay, just a little bit of a self introduction. So my name is Ore. I'm uh, from Singapore. I'm based here. And uh, I am, I do, I'm a documentary photographer, that's, that's how I identify myself, but I do editorial work, editorial work, uh, commercial and corporate work for bread and butter. Yeah, so, um, okay, so this, this story, this uh, series that you are looking at, this is the story of a town in Laos, right, it's a town in Laos, and what's, what, uh, what fascinated me about this town is that, so it's right at the border with China. Okay. And uh, the Laos government, they actually leased the land, about 1,600 uh, hectares of land, to a Chinese developer. Okay. So it's under their, they call it the special economic zone. So they, land it to a, they, they lease it to a Chinese developer for about 30 years. Okay. Of course, Chinese being Chinese, they started building casinos, a few casinos, not just one. So like a casino hotels. And uh, they, they, they plan, the plan is to develop an entire township around the casinos. So you have residential buildings, if you look at the, the third image, so that's actually a residential building. And then you also have uh, sports and recreational activity. So you can see a swimming pool, so that's, that's a swimming pool over there. And then that's, I don't know, some hidden paradise, uh, that one over there. So they even have playground. So it's it's made um, it's made for families as well and kids. So that's that's the plan. Okay. So within the within the first few years of operating, uh, it was very busy. It attracted a lot of uh, visitors, mainly from China. Okay, because gambling is illegal in China. So they would just uh, cross the border. It's in the Yunnan Yunnan province. So they would cross the border and then you know to go gamble in, in this town called, uh, they call it the golden city of Botan. So in Chinese, it means uh, Huang Xingchen, which is, you know, because of all the money that's involved in it, right? Okay, so, um, so it was very busy. Uh, at its peak, there were around 10,000 population, 10,000 people living there. Most of them were Chinese, about almost 90% of them were Chinese. And uh, the town ran on Beijing time, and the Chinese currency, the yuan, was uh, was what was used to do for for transactions. And of course, they all spoke Mandarin. Um, for the locals that were there, uh, most of them they were either let's say the border patrol, or they were workers, you know, working in restaurants and in the casinos, etc. So that, and I think that lasted for almost three years. So almost three years. And after that, there were stories, stories that came out from this town, you know, stories of kidnappings, murders, beatings. And uh, there was a few Chinese journalists who visited uh, the casino uh, with a hidden camera, and they managed to film some of these beatings and kidnappings that were happening. And also there was an, there was an uh, accident, there was an incident. Uh, according to some Chinese media, they say that uh, at one point, the casino operators, they actually detained up to 100 Chinese. Okay? They detained them in the casinos because they couldn't pay their debts. And the Chinese government, they had to send their officials down to negotiate for their release. And of course, uh, they were all eventually released and they went back to China. Then shortly after, the Chinese government put pressure on the Laos government to close down the casino because you know that's where a lot of corruptions were happening, a lot of money flowing out of China. So they forced it to close down, they put pressure on the Laos government and they also cut the water supply because it was at the border so the water supply were coming from, uh, was, was coming from China. So they cut the supply and eventually the, you know, the casinos were closed down and almost overnight, okay maybe not so exaggerating, but almost overnight people left because without the gamblers, without the visitors to the casinos, none of the businesses could survive. So there was no one there, there was no one visiting there. So uh, people left, you know, uh, they just abandoned, they, uh, they abandoned the, the, the city basically. So you could see that um, a lot of these facilities, they look very new because when that happened, the town was still, uh, was still under construction. A lot of things were new. The, so the third image, that one, on the surface, right, on the outside, it looks new, but when you go in, so that's actually the fourth, the fourth image, so that's what it looks like outside, and that is what it looks like inside. 
So um, yeah, so it was it was abandoned. But there were still people. There were still people there because you know they had invested so much. Like they built hotels, they built businesses. So they they were still there, and they were hoping that things would change because um, there was news, a lot of rumors saying that. Laos wants to build a high-speed railway train through the through the country, linking it to China and Thailand. And this town, Boten, it would be the last stop before the train goes to China. So they're hoping that okay, eventually this uh, they would build this high-speed train, and then you know things would come back, uh, the businesses would come back again. So the last time I visited. Um, I visited this place was about almost two years ago. So when I was there, um, the lease were already uh, it was already taken over by another Chinese developer. Okay, so um, they plan to build an I don't know, international financial center. They want to build golf courses. Uh, they have duty free shopping zones. So they they, they pumped in almost one point five billion dollars to you know they want to revive it and you know to, to turn it into something else. So that's the yeah. So so that's the idea. So for me, it's very fascinating because it's. I mean, I'm almost like recording the the the, the life and death, and then now that it's coming back alive again. Yeah. So um, I I can I'll just run uh, run run this through a slideshow so you guys can look at the photos better. I was there um, a, a few a few times over several years. Um, Yeah, that's the last that's the last picture. So this this uh, these photos they are part of a much uh, larger project that um, I'm working on right now. Um, and this project is uh, it's about Laos. Okay? So it uh, loosely follows this uh, proposed high-speed railway um, train that Laos wants to build. Um, just to give you a little bit of context, so Laos is one of the poorest and least developed countries in the world. Okay? And uh, the north of Laos especially is very mountainous and they've never had any trains in the country before. So imagine this ambition that they have, right? that they want to build not even just a normal rail, but it's a high-speed railway. Okay, so they want to have a high-speed train that cuts uh, across the country from the center where Vientiane, the capital is, and then it goes all the way up north and eventually linking it to China. 
So of course, um, they don't have the money and they don't have the resources to build this. And the Chinese came in, you know, saying, okay, we'll help you. We'll loan you the money. We will provide you with our team, our experts to help you build this. And it comes with, as you can imagine, it comes with a, strings of, uh, a string of conditions. Um, okay, we don't know for sure what the deal is, um, but we can only guess and speculate that, okay, but there were, there were rumours that they wanted land, like five, kilom five kilometres of land along the railway track, and then they want, of course, they're going to, you know, the land, uh, Laos is uh, very rich in resources. They're poor, but they have a lot of land, they have a lot of forest, and a lot of minerals that's, that's underground. Um, and they have a river, the Mekong River runs through the country, so a lot of potential for hydropower. Okay, so with the Chinese involvement, it's always very complicated. So for me, it's just looking at this whole idea of development. What does it mean, you know, at what cost does it come, you know, does it come with? Um, for Laos, the, to them, development is okay, building infrastructure, building dams, okay, and then having all these foreign investments. Um, and no, maybe, maybe, okay, just for Laos, right? So a lot of it is Chinese involvement, a lot of it is Chinese money. And so, um, yeah, so then you have all these uh, things that comes along with it. There's uh, politics, there is uh, there's the economical implications, there's social, and then there's also the environmental impact of it. So I'm just yeah, looking at, you know, like raising, trying to raise all these questions and then looking for answers. But of course, I'm not trying to, with my photos, I'm not saying that, okay, I, I'm going to, you know, present this solution to, to all these answers, to all these questions, because uh, it's, not, it's not my place, it's not my place to do that. Um, and yeah, it would be too ambitious and self-righteous to, to say that I can do that with my photo projects. So I'm just, with my photos, I'm just looking at what's happening and how does it impact the people on the ground. Um, for me, I think it's a very important story because even though it happened, it's happening in Laos, but it's actually a very universal, a very universal story. It's not, it's not just happening in Laos. It's, it's in South America. It's in Africa, and it's even in Singapore. Yeah. So that's why I'm working on this uh, project, this personal project of mine. Yes. Um, do we still have time? For you, of course. <laughs> Okay. Is, so, is there anything else you want to share? Um, there's this slide show that the dam, the dam sure. project. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you guys have been following the news, you would know that recently uh, there was a dam in southern Laos that collapsed, leading to a flooding of the nearby areas. So this dam. So I'm as part of this uh, this Laos project. One of the topics is also this mega dams that Laos is trying to build. Um, they have built some already, and the, the, the dam that collapsed in the southern part of Laos, is, it's halfway, it's halfway, it's not complete yet, so it's halfway through. Um, so it, it raises, with this accident, it raises the issues of uh, safety, it's the standards of safety over there. And on top of that, you know, people are already talking about the environmental impact and the people who, you know, who has to be relocated and whether are they compensated and what about the loss of their livelihood, etc., etc. So um, I did a story on a dam that's near uh, Long Prabang. It's called Sayaburi Dam. It's a huge project because it's on the main Mekong River. And you know the Mekong River runs through China, Laos, um, Thailand, Vietnam, and Cambodia. So if you want to build something on the main uh, mainstream Mekong, you have to consult with the rest of the other countries. And so what happens is, okay, so there was a consultation and there was a lot of opposition from Vietnam and Cambodia because they are further down the river and they, they strongly oppose this, this dam project. But Laos, they just, you know, they just went ahead and built it. <laughs> yeah, so, um, it is, yeah, it's quite a huge project. So I went there, I visited the, I visited the area um, and I did, I did uh, some photos of it. So it's in a slideshow. So Yeah. Oh, just, just. 
do we do? How do I full screen it? The green button. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think the sound is not. That's the end of my presentation. Thanks, guys, for your attention. <laughs>
about my work in very very political way, um, especially when they heard that I'm come from Thailand, which in Thailand we have a, a problem with the military, like we have uh, like thirteen coup d'état in in two thousand and fourteen, and nowadays we are under the control of the military. However, I think for me to to make a work is not only come from the political issue, but my work is also reflect my own memory and my own personal feelings to to like it's about it's just the daily of the Thai teenage who live in a very extremely um, political issue in my in, in country. Um, so uh, yeah, in, in in Thailand we have a very main problem with the monarchy because the 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 late king, which um, passed away last year, I think, he is the very famous king and very very influenced person. Um, he is very genius politician at the same time for Thai people. He is not human. He is God. So, yeah, so the, the political issue in, in Thailand, um, they believe that not only the, the king is God, according to Hindu, mixed with um, Buddhism belief. So this word um, is called empty mirror, which is, according to Hindu, uh, empty mirror is the, the highest um, mountain, which is the place for king and angels. So actually, this black figure is me and my friends, and the the white suit is like the old people who are trying to control the town in Thailand. And uh, yeah, the, the little green one is might be, you know, some some kind of the power they hold. So generally, it's talk about my own experience and my own perspective to the political issue in my country. Um, yeah, to. To be in the the country, every students in the Thailand they actually they they um, they they receive a lot of the freedom of thinking, so it's quite um, very normal to them to to do whatever they want. However, this a very control of how they think about the political. They might smoke in the floor, they might be gay. It's very okay to, you know, to act everything, to, to be gay and to, um, to smoke or whatever you, you want to be. But they, they don't let to, I would say, they don't let to grow up in terms of they, they shouldn't talk about political. They shouldn't talk about the, the monarchy or the, the king because uh, they taught that it is the issue of the adult. So this is the picture of the, of the Thai students who is the, like a cadet. And The, the, the right picture, it is in like a, in Thailand we have like a student day and I would say like uh, most of the children, they will wearing a, a soldier's uniform because the, for general children, soldier is something very cool for them and the, uh, and the picture, there is also cadet. 
so uh, this this work I I shot in uh, 2014. Yeah, it's almost about the the feeling of the Thai students have been freed, have not allowed to grow up. Um, these two photographs for me is very important. Um, a couple of photographs because uh, for me is on the right hand. He is um, the the old man from the the king ceremony, and it's it's very very weird that he decorated himself with the Christmas light, so he can he can illuminate and he can visible for the for the another people and on the on the left hand there is the scout boy which every student in thailand they has been forced to attain this ceremony to hold the candle and if you notice the in his hand the candle drop to his hand and he was um, forced by the teacher to hold it very still and for me this two picture is very contrast picture between younger generation and older generation so my work is mainly for me i consider to be the young 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 voice that question about what what is the older people do to to my country and to to uh, to the future of the country all my all my work is like um, this kid is mean like a, a younger generation that run through the very dark and dim and weird world in, in Thailand. This um, last year I had an exhibition in Bangkok and for some reason the, the military came down to the gallery and asked me to remove this picture. I think it's very important picture because actually the frame in the Middle East the king portrait and it has been cut out and this picture I wanted to remind like uh, is is a gate to the heaven because in Thailand the the belief of the heaven hell and marriage is very powerful for um, for the government control Yeah, and, and I would like to end the, the picture with the fish because um, personally I feel like to, I'm very fascinated to, to go into aquarium, did the series called aquarium and yeah it's kind of a, a feeling of living in a very propaganda country it's like we live in the aquarium. Um, we like it's the real water. We we like we literally have uh, freedom to you know to swim. However, we are in the very very um, fake environment. So yeah, so so I want to end up with the fish in the sky, and at the same time, it's fake sky. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Harit. Um, so Harit is our uh, Young Portfolio Award winner, and I think he perfectly exemplifies what uh, a Young Portfolio winner should be. It's evocative, it's full, the work is full of curiosity. Uh, you can see that he's experimenting with different sort of uh, ideas, uh, expression, uh, and the work has a lot of questions, and I think uh, uh, I'm 
very happy that he has actually uh, taken our first uh, Young Portfolio Award. So, without further ado, we'll uh, invite uh, uh, Hari from uh, India to share his work uh, that you see on the right side here. So let's uh, give him Hari a little bit more. He traveled uh, 19 hours uh, to come and uh, spend uh, two evenings with us. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I started my professional life as a photojournalist with a newspaper, and mostly I've been doing documentary photography. But somewhere down the line, my interest moved to uh, more non-journalistic work, because my interests are really not just confined to photography, but I'm interested in filmmaking, literature, writing, text-based work. So, um, as I, as I, I'll show you my work where I proceed from purely photojournalistic work towards more uh, open-ended work which would be considered art photography. So, just to give the context to the work which is displayed here, I want to take you through a certain journey in India in a place called Varanasi. Varanasi is one of the holiest cities <coughs> for Hindus. Um, it's also one of the very, Hindus have a very complicated relationship with cities and rivers and everything. You know, I, I, on the one hand, they worship it, but at the same time, uh, they're completely ignorant about polluting it or destroying it. So it's a it's, it's very complicated relation, which is what I want to express. So this is uh, mostly street photography in Varanasi. So I'm gonna quickly run through this. So this is a place where <clears throat> Varanasi is also famous for uh, the cremation grounds. Or it's called the Burning Ghats. Um, Varanasi is a city which is founded next to the Ganges. And Hindus have a belief that if you take a dip in the Ganges, all your sins will be washed away. But that's where the problem starts. You know, People can do lots of things to wash away the sins. And, <laughs> and yeah, that's where the ambiguity comes from. So this is a... Um, bunch of people um, at the cremation ceremony and this man is uh, the person whose family relative has passed away and the other people are accompanying uh, for the ceremony. And this is one of the, uh, this, so there are many pyres burning at the same time here. So Varanasi has a lot of Hindu mythology associated with every part of the city. Is you know got some story associated with Ramayana or Mahabharata or one of the gods of Hindu. So it's 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 a place dense with mythologies. So a lot of literature in especially in Hindi, the North Indian part of the, Varanasi is uh, towards northern part of India. So the a lot of Hindu mythology and literature has seeped into the consciousness of people. If you walk there, you can actually feel something which is quite different from the rest of the country. So, the next is, uh, this is for Kevin because he actually 
went to India to shoot this place called Kumbh Mela. This happens every f- once in, once every four years. Yes. And last time when Kevin was there, it was 2013, and about 80 million people gathered for this religious ceremony. Basically, it's a place where um, Ganges and another river called Yamuna and a mythological river called Saraswati they meet, and it's. There are some auspicious timings when if you take a dip in the water, you're supposed to, it's a shortcut to heaven. So, um, so it's a deep religious belief where people come with a lot of effort and it's, it's extremely cold at that time. So it's quite a thing to be there. So I, I really admire that you actually managed to shoot this. So yeah, this is, uh, I went there to uh, do still photography for a filmmaker and Whenever I got some time, I shot some pictures. So, so I'm showing this work to connect with my work here a little. So, yeah. So these are um, they're called naga sadhus. These are monks who have. They basically represent the extreme form of Hinduism, which, of course, most of the people cannot connect to. But they live a very austere lifestyle where they don't wear clothes, they, they eat some really crazy food. They live in extremely cold places like Himalayas without clothes. And they, they have practices which are very um, esoteric, very secretive, and insane. I would say it's really insane. So, yeah, we can talk about more later, but. Right now, these guys are just doing that. So they um, they generally don't come into the cities or any place. They generally go into seclusion after the uh, for four years. They come down for this ceremony and then go back to their um, ashrams or the, the places where they stay with the guru. So yeah. Since we are close to Himalayas, I wanted to show this work uh, <clears throat> in Himalayas called, it's a place called Malana. And um, it's famous in India, also a lot of uh, Europeans know it because it makes the best hashish in the world. So, so it's like the drug uh, hashish kingdom of the world. And, and they make, it's like supposedly the best hashish. So Malana grows up, the Malana uh, marijuana grows up in the Himalayas and it's really pure and, and it's really potent. So th- the whole village is basically, economy is based on making hashish, including children. So during September, October, children completely stop going to school and then start making hashish. Um, so it's, 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 it's a part of the culture there. So smoking hashish is also a part of Hindu culture, so it's not literally illegal but it's semi-legal let's say so you can smoke but you can't sell it and things like that Um, but hashish is like a really important form of uh, this marijuana so selling that's an illegal drug but uh, so the government is trying to dissuade them from this hashish economy and get them into other things but there are other problems like things like education access to resources and since it's isolated, then they're politically isolated, they don't have any um, power to make any changes in the village, things like that. So yeah, I wanted to see what the situation in the village is because we hear a lot about it, but nobody, and, and they for a long time they were very hostile to outsiders. So everybody from outside were um, untouchables, like you know, they wouldn't talk to you, they wouldn't touch you, they wouldn't let you into the village, but, <clears throat> There are a lot of uh, 
a construction activity in the Himalaya region for making dams. And because of that, there's a power projects happening. And because of that, the roads are being built nearby. So the access to the village has increased. Now there's a television and mobile phones. So things have dramatically changed in the last 10 years. And now they allow tourists and people to come and meet them and stay there. But photography is something which is they're a little touchy about. But I spent some time with people there and got to uh, make friends with the family. So I got some access, so I wanted to quickly run through that. So this is a view of the village from one, one, uh, like a slightly higher vantage point. So this is early morning, the kids are getting ready for school. So one of the mythology which they have is that they believe they're not Indians actually, but they are actually descendants of Greek army. So when Alexander invaded India, uh, the, the story they believe is that some of the soldiers stayed back in India and these guys are basically uh, descendants of the Greek army. So, so the language they speak is not connected to any Indian language, not even the local uh, area. So it has Tibetan and other mixture of uh, languages which none of us can understand. So, in fact, people call it devil's language, you know, because of the complete strangeness to it. So, sheep rearing is one of the activities they do, uh, apart from hashish, which is the main thing. So, this is a kid showing one of the kid's hand, um, basically like, you know, uh, making hashish. So again, it's most of the men smoke up. It's a part of the culture there, and it's they don't see anything problematic with that, and 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 they think it's like a part of uh, an offering to the god. <coughs> this is a woman um, who's drying sheep wool. Just in that day, it was a sunny day, so she just put the sheep wool on herself, and she just stood there to dry it, sun dry it. This is a snowstorm coming in. So they have this wedding. Uh, again, uh, they do not marry outsiders, which is of course changing now, but generally they're not allowed to do that. So this is a temple they have. Again, anybody who visits the village cannot touch the temple. They, you'll be fined thousand rupees or something. They have a fire ceremony in the night, and there's a fire lit for the whole night. So this is a family I stay with. Um, generally, yeah, it's like dinner time. So they have this rituals twice a year, and and they dress up in a completely non traditional Indian, it's not a traditional Indian dress at all. Again, it can have some Greekish features, which I can, you can see that. So this is how they have things, which is unusual, you know. This is after a snowstorm. So these guys are just watching the ceremony from higher point. So this is like the evening snacks. They just butchered a lamb, small lamb, and just roasting it to feed each other. Kids playing. Okay, so this work is, um, so basically it's, um, this is a work on pollution in the Ganges. So a lot of photographers have done documentary work on the effects of industrial pollution. And there's lots of aspects to pollution. There's 
industrial pollution, which is a huge problem. And then there's human sewage problem, like the cities dump all the sewage into the rivers without cleaning them. And then there's farming problem, the pesticides which run off with the water come and go into the water. And then uh, there's this problem of building dams on the river which slow down the flow of the river. So the, this problem is not just a simple problem, it's a very complicated problem which has to be approached from all directions. And the government of India buys technology from Europe based on the success, like Thames River had huge, pollution, huge pollution problem and they tried to implement some other stuff from Europe. But conditions in India are extremely different. So any solution which you buy off the shelf from other countries just don't work. And uh, for example, to run a machine uh, 24 hours to clean the water is not going to work because there are a lot of power cuts. And power cuts has other problems because of other problems. So even a simple thing like you know, running a machine to clean the river is complicated. You know? so, um, so what I did was instead of doing a traditional photography of documenting you know, this industry polluting it or this kind of pollution happening here, I wanted to approach it from a more personal and a visceral way. Like, you know, it, the point is like if pollution affects the bodies and skin, I wanted to see, you know, how does it affect a photographic surface? So it's just like a skin of the body. I wanted the photographic surface to be affected by the pollution and the pollutants. Um, so I, I used found materials found in the river and along the river to highlight those aspects. To it. So my approach was essentially playing with the materiality of images. So this is a photogram. Photogram is basically placing any object on top of a photographic surface and exposing it to light. Uh, so this is a shroud used to wrap a dead body in, in Varanasi, the, the cremation ground. I took the shroud and uh, used the contaminated water and placed it on the photographic print. So just to briefly mention the cyanide process, it's one of the earliest photographic process where uh, you use chemicals which are iron based but instead of just light, it's sensitive to ultraviolet light. So only sunlight affects it. This light will not affect that chemical. So it used to be called blueprints. And if you see the old architectural uh, maps of houses or buildings, they were bluish. And so cyanotype was before Xeroxes and photocopy. That's how they made uh, uh, maps of the buildings and multiple copies. So. Um, this is a shroud of a dead body, which I use as a photogram. Uh, this is the ash, which is from the cremation ground. So when, when you burn a dead body, it completely doesn't, does not disintegrate. It has bones, and if you have like, metals and everything, that also goes into it, flesh, everything. So I use that. Uh, bones, flesh, and ash on the print and use the water collected from the site. This is the actual mud from one of the cremation grounds. So I wanted the photographic print to actually feel, how does it feel like um, getting that mud on your body? So that's something like that. This is like, um, so, um, like I said, there are a lot of mythological associations with the river and, and a lot of superstitions. So people do not, people just throw the dead bodies into the river for many reasons, for superstitious reasons. Like, for example, if a man is bitten by a cobra and he dies with a co co snake bite, you can't burn his body. So they just dump the body in the river. Okay, so that's one of the problems. So if, if, a, if a child dies, you can't burn the ch child's body, you can't cremate them. So they just dump into the river. So the idea is that if you, if your body is thrown into a river, you go to the heaven. That's the underlying philosophy. So yeah, so there are lots of this, uh, it's completely like a mess in a lot of places. So this is a rotting dead body found in Varanasi, which is like where a lot of tourists go walk by. And this is like, uh, I don't know, month long dead body, which was just rotting there. So. So the thing is, Varanasi is a place where you, it's so, such an intense place that 
it can be a big turn off but at the same time it's got something which is like very spiritual so a lot of people go there again and again because it's something that pulls them but at the same time some people are like oh my god i'll never go to this place so it's it, it's like that so it's got extreme contrast and extreme reactions from people so people will just walk by this and say okay i'm going to come back again so so this guy is a scavenger who collects metals like gold like when when people burn the body they have like gold rings or gold tooth or whatever and after the body is burnt they dump the ashes into a river so this guy goes and collects coins or metals which are good. so the thing is like it's highly contaminated but they just do it and this is um, place where the city sewage comes and dumps into the river without processing it so again it's one of the so a huge part of varanasi city is not connected to a sewage system so again the, that's a big problem the city shit comes into the water which is what people pray as a goddess so that was so those pictures were from varanasi so i also wanted to look at the industrial aspect to it and so there's a place called kanpur which is uh, very well known for leather industries so the british when india was a colony of british they established leather industry in kanpur in 19th century so there are a lot of tanneries which process leather are still running from the british time and of course they're very inefficient highly contaminating and a lot of them are illegal now but they still function because of corruption uh, or people don't care and people don't know what what is going on so one of the chemical which is used in the tannery is it's called hex, uh, hexavalent chromium chromium is a highly cancer causing dangerous toxic chemical and that's used to basically bleach the leather so i i use so and after the leather is processed the uh, useless leather is just thrown into the city as it dumps so this is like if you're walking by the road you'll see leather dumps like this but they have chromium in it so i used chromium to bleach the print to show the effect of how it what happens to our skin if it you know we are contaminated by it so this is again um, a factory which makes glue by melting leather again i used chromium on the print this is uh, a glue factory again so these guys are actually inside the tannery processing the leather with chromium um i painted their bodies with chromium because for me they just you know faceless and nameless they just hundreds and thousands of workers working there in really you know deadly conditions so this is again a photogram i made of a portrait of a leather worker so i use leather pieces collected from the site to put it on the photographic print and expose it to light so this is a, a portrait with photograms of the found material <clears throat> this is how chromium actually looks when it reacts with the photographic print so this is dried chromium you can see here so the blue is a cyanotype and this dried up one is chromium so i'll just skip this so a lot of water which comes from the tanneries also go into the farms and that water which comes to the farms is supposed to be processed by the uh, cleaning industries and of course they're not clean and this is the foam coming from the water from the cleaning source so it's clearly heavily contaminated and this goes into the food which eventually you know it's a whole food chain and then into the river and i use this foam to make an impression on the photographic paper so this is how that um, impression looks like so this is <clears throat> one i wanted to extend this idea into uh, a more conceptual work so so far this is like really, really uh, idea of how the image itself is affected by the contamination so i wanted to do more uh, of a conceptual uh, work where i spent 24 hours at a drain making a print with the 
contaminants every one hour. So for 24 hours, I made 24 prints. So it was more like you know um, performativity. It's like you have a certain instruction to do this, and you just do it and produce the work. That's how it is. So these are 24 hours at one of the drains which uh, contaminate the river. And then I thought, you know, each, so these are 24 blocks, which represent, each of them represent one hour. So then I thought like maybe each, if I see this as a unit of time in a day, I can break this up into like minutes. I can further break them into seconds. How will this look? So I wanted to try that. And so this is like breaking that into minutes. Six, so each block would be broken into 60 pieces. So I glued them like this. And then that can be done in many ways. You can cut the uh, block in many, many rectangles, many geometrical shapes. This is another way. And this is seconds. So each minute can be further broken into 60 seconds. So I will really cut into like small, small pieces and then uh, glue it like this. So it looks like a noisy thing. So, but this is to me a rhythm of pollution. You know, how from a pure blue, it can turn into something like very noisy, it's like a noisy TV screen, which is just, there's no signal here, just noise. So I wanted to use these ideas to um, work with sound, like extract sound from these uh, data sets and use it eventually. So this is like a work in progress. And the last, can I do, do you have time or? Uh, yeah, quick one. I, I just, I, so I just, since I started with my documentary work and I certainly am moving away towards more very personal work and uh, personal take on things, this is a work I did with my wife together and I just want to quickly run a dummy which we made together. So it's called, so it's called, I'll be looking at the moon, but I'll be seeing you. <clears throat> okay. So um, my approach was photography and my wife is a writer. So it was more, her thing was text-based and uh, interventions like erasure and poetry and things like that. And so we somehow fought a lot and collaborated and some of this is a shape we agreed on. So let's see how it is. So it's still a work in progress, we're just working. So you don't have to read it, it just, I'm just, it's, even I can't read this, you know, it's really. <laughs> so we use a lot of intervention, like, you know, with materials, so, I, I so what I was trying to get at is like, you know, uh, for me, the photographic surface is no longer two-dimensional, I wanted to see how it can be extended to three dimensions, so it, it could be more like an installation, so I'm using materials to work on the images.
So these are drawings from diaries entries. So we used some embroidery here. Thank you very much, uh, Ari, our Art Award winner. Uh, I guess we will see that uh, work in the future in our awards as well. Yes, hopefully. <laughs> okay, so what we'll do now is uh, we will uh, invite uh, all the, uh, the three of them to come, come in the front. And also, uh, we also have two finalists uh, here as well, Amrita. Uh, so they will join the dialogue session, we can all sort of sit beside And uh, uh, Andre can come up as well. So while we're preparing, yeah, um, Rita is a, a finalist in our Young Portfolio Award as well. She's from Singapore. And uh, Andre is uh, a finalist for a photo book. Uh, his uh, little booklet is over there. Uh, work on uh, the... Uh, maybe I'll just let them uh, briefly talk about each of what they actually did. Yes, and a documentary, and a finalist of the documentary as well, for the same body of work. Oh, what my work is? Yeah. Just this one for me. Okay, uh, thank you guys for being here. Uh, I think it's incredible work that's being shown, and I mean, I think uh, it's very impressive. Uh, I'm, I'm Andre, I'm from Indonesia, I'm based in Bali. Uh, I'm a documentary photographer, and so I nominated, I was a finalist for Two categories was the, the, the book, and you can see here, which is more of a newsprint style. Um, this is my my long term project on documenting the HIV AIDS epidemic in, in Papua, which is the easternmost province of Indonesia. And uh, this was actually a multi platform um, project. Should I talk about the whole thing? Or just so, yeah, I mean, so I actually did a printed uh, kind of medium like this. I also created a, uh, a, a website and I made a video. So, the, the idea behind this project was to uh, how do we help uh, end the stigma and discrimination against people living or facing HIV? Because I started the project in 2008, uh, so it was about an eight year long project, and there's been a lot of improvement in. In the province, in terms of access to health and providing medicine, but the biggest obstacle was basically the, the, this negative uh, perception of the disease. Basically, HIV means death. HIV means dishonor. So a lot of people were not getting tested. A lot of people were not 
getting the treatment even though they're available. So what I did was I created, I profiled seven people, and you can see here, uh, seven of the people who are living with HIV and they're productive, meaning they're, they could have children that's not HIV positive, they, they're able to work, they're able to live a normal life, and the idea was to show uh, you know, this visual or positive visuals to, to the people living in, you know, in the region. Because all they see is people, death, people suffering. So, uh, and the reason why I made a thousand copies is because uh, Papua has, it's, it's a very remote place where internet is available in, in most of the places. So how do we get, um, you know, the message out so that we can have it in front of them? And the reason why I created a, a news print is because it's much, cheap, much cheaper to me. And I wanted to actually make it a bit bigger because, um, as you can see, the, the, it's more of a character driven story. So I want to kind of like amplify their portrait, their personality, and, you know, something that's, you know, you can hold with both hands. You know, so a lot of thought were, take, were taken to the design, even the color. Uh, I, don't want, I don't want to use the red because red means danger, red, red means, you know, stop. You know, tension. And I, I want to use yellow or orange to show change, to show progress, and this transition. And even uh, you know, iron positive. The, the, the name is called iron positive, meaning iron positive. So even the title already trying to counter the negative association with being positive. You know, like I'm positive for life. That's, so basically, so you want to look through this, and then you can go to the website. So there's actually an Indonesian version, and also there's an English version as well. And this is actually in Bahasa, again, because my audience speaks Bahasa. So there's no point of creating, you know, the new English. So that's just a brief thing about my project. All right, great. Thank you, Andre. So you can see uh, uh, we're very uh, happy to have Andre's uh, work in the findings as well as a good example of uh, photography for advocacy. Uh, now I'll just uh, let uh, Andre to contest give yourself some context in terms of what she actually does. Uh, hi, I'm Amrita and I'm from Singapore. Uh, we time to counter mostly documentary and commercial work to sort of survive. Um, <laughs> that's the truth. Anyways, um, I submitted two stories um, for the young portfolio category. Um, so you probably will be able to see the slideshow like from another day or um, one of the stories called All Is Not Lost, which um, focuses on a really young Singaporean girl's battle with uh, hair loss, which, uh, which is also known as alopecia. Um, so the way I sort of photographed it was sort of, I mean, it's a little bit hard to explain when the picture's not up over here, but if you would have a look at it on my website, um, it was more of like a journey to a hair loss, like to experience of her nightmares and her hopes and her dreams and whatever she wishes for in the future while undergoing through this journey. Um, and uh, the work is still in progress and um, I produced the work through a mentorship with like the other Southeast Asian photographers from 2016 to 2017 and the exhibition is like currently occurring. Uh, we also have a photo book I think in objectives, uh, it, the title of the book is called We Will Have Been Young. So if you want to buy it, go have a look on the shop. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. He just gave me a book. Speaking of that, so you can share the photos of these other photos. Yes.
there's different types of elevation. Elevation which she has is called elevation areata, which is due to uh, autoimmune disease, which obviously can be like attacks your hair follicles. So um, initially, when I started on the project, it was very documentary style, and I didn't really like what I was shooting. And, and I, in the end, changed approach, sat down with her and said, hey, how do you want to picture yourself in the project? And we went through like places and memories to sort of like form this uh, entire concept together. So um, each place sort of explores like her dreams and her nightmares and her hopes and yeah. Anyways, uh, that's like part A of the project. So I'm looking to explore other types of Indonesia and uh, we'll see how it turns out in the next few years. But yeah, the book is there in the, the shop, so please have a look at it. And um, the other project which I covered is completely different from this. Uh, I went to Sri Lanka in 2015 and um, I photographed a project which investigates, not really investigate, but sort of like document the things and places where uh, basically there was a civil war between the Tamil Tigers and, and um, the, the Sri Lankan government. Uh, if you don't know who the Tamil Tigers are, they are like a, well, they are, they are like a rapper group who are actually fighting for a uh, a separate um, country. Uh, so basically, if you if you were to um, ask anyone from Sri Lanka or if you were to know the history of Sri Lanka, the northern side of Sri Lanka are mostly dominated by the Tamils, and down south is more of the Sinhalese. And uh, there's been a lot of uh, unrest which has been going on in the last like 26 to 30 years between the Sinhalese and the Tamils. So um, so Tamils had enough of it. They formed a group and then it blew into this full-scale conflict which ended like in 2009. But in this process, about 100,000 Tamils have just gone missing without any trace. And the interesting thing is, a lot of the family members actually know who has taken away their family member, like their family member basically in this process. So um, a lot of them have claimed that they are actually Sinhalese military officers who have taken them away on the pretext of questioning them to see if they are with the Tamil Tigers. And uh, so there's been a lot of atrocities which has been committed during this conflict from both sides, just not from the, 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 the Sinhalese side, including the Tamil side as well. But anyways, um, I went there thinking that they were still looking for their family members actively on the streets, but that was not the case. And then I realized the story was actually within their homes and with the things which were left behind by the missing loved ones, the empty surroundings where the family members are still waiting for them to come back. Some of them have been missing for more than a decade, some of them have been missing for like the past five years. So it's all like a big question mark and next year would be 10 years since the conflict has happened and uh, there's still no answers to where their whereabouts is and it's a big mystery to everybody. So, yeah, if you were to go online or maybe when you come back another day, you'll be able to see it up on the slideshow. Anyways, thanks for listening to me. Okay. All right, thank you. So, uh, if you want to come back after the talk uh, tomorrow, uh, we actually have projections of all the finest works uh, uh, looping. So, uh, you will get to see actually everybody's work. Uh, on our website as well, there's more information with all the showcases of all the actual uh, finest as well. So just before we move on to the Q&A, open up for the Q&A, I just want to acknowledge one of our sponsoring partners who didn't come last night for the opening, uh, John, John Cho, uh, he's uh, from Canadian Press. Uh, yeah. So he's our uh, uh, partner that actually helped with the prints uh, and also the certs and also the uh, book that we have here. So thank you very much for uh, the support. Uh, that we've gotten from actually uh, Korea and other, uh, other partners along with uh, the as well. So without further ado, let's open up the questions uh, during this session. So if anyone has any questions for uh, any one of our panelists, uh, our winners or our finalists, uh, feel free to uh, sit now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> anyone has any questions? Johnson, you want to pick it up? I saw you wrote a lot of notes. <laughs> um, 
Yes? translator for, for these refugees and he was still doing translation work when I moved uh, in 2009 when the war just ended and the kind of stories he used to bring back every time when I used to visit the house just horrified me and I think a part of me also felt very guilty that how come we don't really get such you know detailed information or how, how are the Tamils so unaware about this situation in Singapore. And then um, Channel 4 dropped a documentary called The Killing Fields where, uh, because a lot of the journalists, uh, they were not allowed to, to enter when, when the last stages of the war was going on and, and this documentary was made out of uh, uh, whatever mobile phones the people had on ground and it, I don't know, it just, it really, it really horrified me. I was really, really sad, really affected. And um, I was also photographing the protest by the Tamils as well, like seeking for answers to this genocide. Um, the women who have been raped, you know, uh, loved ones have gone missing, um, even journalists who have been killed, you know, so, so many of these um, demonstrations were going on in the UK as well. So I think all of that kind of, you know, was just 
mounting on and, and I eventually moved back to Singapore and I was like, I have to go and I need to find out. I mean, I can't solve anything, you know, but I need to go and see for myself and and uh, yeah, and I think that's where the journey actually started and and, and uh, it's, 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 it's still a big question mark and, and I'm hoping to go back to the end of the year or at least next year when the it's the 10th anniversary, so yeah. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Speaker, I was just wondering, is there any other projects in terms of war journalism that you're working on? No, it's just, it's, it's only this one, which is, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Great. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone? One of 
the uh, one of my uh, activists, uh, he said, Andre, your, your, I, I took the your, uh, the newsprint on a uh, uh, to a, a public speaking forum, and people were asking me which one of the people in the, in the newsprint is HIV positive, and you know because they all look healthy. You know, again, that's the idea is how do we counter negative visuals about people? You know, and well, the idea is to create positive visual art. You know, the way we think, the way we perceive this world is, is visual. You know, because if you go to the hospitals, for example, in Indonesia especially, you go in there and there's just nothing but photos of diseases, and you end up like, you're looking at yourself, maybe I have this disease and that disease, and it's already ingrained in your mind, which I don't get. You're already stressed out, you're already afraid for your life, and then you go in a, in a room and you're surrounded by all of these things. Um, so, I mean, it's a, um, it, it's, 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 it's something that is, it's, and I'll even, I ask a lot of the, uh, all the people that I, that I profile, I still get in touch with them, like, have you, by being published, by being featured on this, has, have you had any kind of threat against you or anything happens to you? Like, no, people came up to me and they say, hey, I recognize you from that, uh, from the newsprint. You know, and they were really inspired by their stories. So, I, I mean, all in all, you know, I mean, I thought it was a, you know, I thought it was a good success. And again, when you involve the, you know, I, you have to make sure that you're transparent and, uh, to the people that you photograph because in this situation, uh, you have to let them know what's at risk. And sometimes when, uh, when someone said, yes, uh, you can photograph me, you as a photographer, you. If someone says yes, that doesn't mean that, okay, then I'm, I'm going to go ahead and publish it. You still have to think about it because that, that person may not understand or comprehend the threat or the potential risks. Because I've had many, you know, issues, uh, for example, uh, especially when it comes to underage uh, prostitutes. Oh yeah, I asked her if I could, if I could publish the photos and she said, okay, but why, why, you know, why is it only the, the, the prostitutes get their photos published but not the pimps? You know, why are we still victimizing the victims in a way? So again, it's, I mean, I've come out tangent about visuals, but I'm just saying that in, in, in many situations, getting a permission from the subject doesn't give you, doesn't wash your hands when something happens to that person when it's published. You know, so just be aware of that drawback, the potential, uh, you know, risks. Okay, good. Anyone else has uh, any questions? So I want to a question for you. How do you have a question for you? Okay. Well, uh, you will go right after you. I think it's my question. <laughs> Who's your question to? Oh, okay. Hi, okay. I just want to ask, uh, what made you choose Laos as uh, the project? and? You said you followed it over years, so I want to ask, like, what changed inside as you were following the process of the place decaying? What changed inside, and did it change your direction of the photography? Okay. Thanks for the question. Actually, my question was at the very end. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, this project first started off as uh, my MA final uh, final year project. So um, I did my MA in London, the London School uh, College of Communication. Uh, I was MA in photojournalism and documentary photography. And um, during so uh, we really need to do a final year project. And um, I'm a trained fanatic, so I just love training. I'm just, I'm just a romantic in me. So I love <laughs> trainings. And uh, I, I read that there is this project called the Trans Asian Railway Network. So it's a project that's uh, conceived by UN. Um, the idea is that they want to connect all of Asia to Europe via train and uh, not through the Trans-Siberian uh, Railway but through a shorter route that would take uh, that would go all the way from Singapore to London so through uh, India, you know, the Middle East and so it's a much shorter route so I was looking at the map and uh, there, was some, there are some missing links and Laos is one of the missing links um, and so, I, I mean, of course, I couldn't do the whole project. This is, this is too big a scale for me. So, I started zooming in on Southeast Asia, 
and among Southeast Asian countries, uh, to Laos, they were one of the missing links. And uh, you know, everybody, you don't know anything about Laos. <laughs> you don't read about it, you know, you don't read anything, so you don't, you don't know what's going on. So for me, that's very, uh, that's, that's, that's the first thing that, you know, that, that part of my interest. And as I read a little bit more about it, um, I realized that the complexity of, of this project for, for them, right? they're such a poor country, so undeveloped, they don't have any trains before this, so how are they going to do it, right? So um, I started speaking to people, um, now not only train experts, but also uh, I went to UN, so they have an office in, uh, in Bangkok, so I spoke to them, and then I, I reached out to uh, academics, to uh, socialists, to environmentalists, you know, to ask them what do they think about this high school railway train. Um, so with that, armed with that research, so I went in. When I uh, when I first started my photography career, I wanted to do photojournalism, you know, because that's what uh, that's what I was exposed to, you know, for National Geographic magazines, newspapers. So that was uh, that was my first point of interest, but. Uh, and so I went in with that approach for the high speed railway uh, train project in Laos. But the problem is, um, it, it hasn't started uh, construction yet. Nothing, nothing was there. Okay. So they've been talking about this uh, just for Laos. They've been talking about it for years. It's something that they've always wanted to do. Um, but uh, there was a lot of negotiations, a lot of uh, deals that they tried to strike with China, but it fell through because either um, for, for various reasons. So when I went there in 2010, so nothing was built. They, they, they had one station, they had one train station in Vientiane, um, and so the, the train came from uh, Thailand, so from the north of Thailand, Long Kai, so it crosses the Mekong River and then it stops right at the border, so that's where the train station is, 3.5 kilometers, so that was all they had when I visited. Um, so I was shooting around the around the train station, the people who were working there, and eventually I just I you know it was it was difficult. It wasn't a visual project at all. So what I did was using the interviews that I did together with uh, the photos that I had to craft a multimedia piece. Um, I edited it in such a way that it's like a conversation between all these uh, various uh, stakeholders, various parties. Um, it's like a debate, you know about. Some of them will be talking about the pros of this project, and some would be talking about the cons of this. So that's how I, um, that's how that uh, that trip, you know, um, that's the result of that trip. So I went back again um, after I uh, after the first initial trip. I went back, and uh, so I couldn't. I realized I couldn't shoot with my digital camera, like because it's, there's just nothing to shoot. So I decided, okay, I will try something else. So I borrowed a film camera, medium format camera, and it was a Seagull, so it was a China-made, not very good quality, but you know, it's, it, it's a friend. So I borrowed it, and I tried shooting it. And uh, if you guys know medium, for medium format camera, you have to look through the viewfinder like this. So you hold it, you look through, and then see what's going on. And it's on film, so you have so it's a hundred uh, one to one format film. It's like twelve frames, and it costs around ten dollars per, per per roll. So, <laughs> so it changed entirely my uh, my approach to photography. I had to slow down. Like you can't imagine. You know, for shooting this shot, you just you, you just press the shutter without thinking, right? For, for this, um, yeah. So I had I, I was forced to slow down. So I became aware of the surroundings, aware of the composition of what's in the frame. And uh, the results came, so after I developed the films, I, I liked it a lot because uh, I think it, it reflected the, the situation that's in Laos right now. There's a lot of waiting a lot for things to happen, you know, they keep hearing that it's coming, they're going to start, but you know, then nothing's happening. And um, the people, the, the people who, who were living, who were living along the proposed railway route, so they were already informed. So they say, okay, if, uh, once, the, once they start developing, you get compensated, you have to move, you have to relocate. Um, so their lives were just uh, in limbo, you know. It, it could just happen like, okay, this, like next week, you were just informed, okay, it's coming, you have to move. So, you know, it's quite, uh, that's, that's how the situation is. So I went in, and that's when I started uh, shooting. Of course, the next time I went, I had a better camera. <laughs> <laughs> So that's how, uh, that's how that's how it started and that's how it's developed like this, this eventual series.
how the visual approach. So it's not the camera. <laughs> so, Harry, uh, so you talked about uh, this particular picture that uh, the military came in and uh, asked you to take the picture down, right? So obviously we know that in Thailand, the Lady Majesty rule is, you know, quite uh, but strong and firmly enforced in uh, Thailand, right? So you as a young artist, uh, when you make your work, and obviously a lot of uh, the things that you ask questions about, you know, uh, about the adults, so to say, uh, how do you, uh, do you, do you think about uh, whether or not, okay, is this uh, going to get in trouble, or is that, Come into your mind when you actually think about the ideas and make the work, or does it not? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but uh, I I never act myself as a very political artist because for me, as I told you, I uh, made a work from my own feeling to the this situation that happened. And for example, like Les Majority Raw, it's very surreal because you know um, the law also also protect the king dog, not himself anymore because we have uh, we 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 have the case that the people Post on his Facebook about his dog, and that person go to jail. And for me, it's not this is not about politics anymore. It just is just a very common sense that everything go very abnormal and absurd and surreal. So yeah, for me, it's very common sense that something go wrong and. We should not surrender it. Okay. Does anyone else uh, have any questions? Yes, watch it. Uh, with the uh, connection with China and all that. 
the young generation, they have, uh, you know, a lot of them grew up in the post-97, so they have, uh, don't have much of a connection with uh, the, the China, but the parents, you know, they have that connection with a lot of them, so called we have, and they, they, go, they go back and, so I think it's a similar sort of, uh, you know, generational sort of uh, experience. Uh, that was a great question. Uh, anyone else have a few, uh, we can throw a few more questions in because uh, they're going to uh, talk and we're going to leave tomorrow, so last chance to you know, strike Toto. <laughs> Uh, okay, maybe uh, uh, we can talk about, uh, I'll just throw a question out there, you know, art, uh, art and art in photography, you know? What is art photography? What is, uh, you know, documentary photography? What does it mean to be an art photographer? What does it mean to be a documentary photographer? Maybe like each of you can actually uh, you know, talk about what it means to you, you know? I'm sure everyone, <laughs> everyone is a very different different sort of person, different sort of practitioner, so, uh, you know. <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's good to start with you because you obviously moved from a very traditional photo sort of journalist and now you're trying, I mean, you, you said, you mentioned that now you view uh, photos merely as images to work with, yeah? Uh, if I quoted you correctly. Yeah. <clears throat> I think photo development documentary has very and strong rules, how it should be. So people keep fighting that this manipulation and the hardcore rules that you can't reach. So it, it's got its own place because of the history of how photography won and media. Uh, so I personally want to go away from that because for me photography is much broader than just a documentary or photogenic. I find it very restrictive to say what I want to say. Uh, so for me, this is like more open-ended and more ambiguity, which uh, personally I'm attracted. And it's also something which my other interests come into this. Uh, I can use those things, which I would say would be much harder to get into photojournalism or documentary photography. It's, it's something which is, I think, not accepted. So maybe the boundaries are moving, uh, but we need to keep pushing. Ari? Um, yeah, so similar like uh, Hari, I also started off wanting to be a photojournalist and then eventually changed to, you know, change different approach. Um, so before my MA, I didn't have any uh, formal education in photography. Um, so at the time, I, but I felt that I needed, uh, I needed some kind of formal, formal study. So I, I went to I went to US. Um, I did a workshop there, and I I checked out uh, I, I took the opportunity to check out a few uh, places that offered. Okay, so I was in uh, New York. So I was in ICP, so International Center of Photography. They have a very uh, very strong uh, uh, course course about uh, photojournalism, uh, version photojournalism course. And I was also in Ohio University where they have an MA in uh, photojournalism. Um, but I felt that, um, that so so photojournalism came from uh, came from the U.S. So they have a very strong tradition of it. But I didn't like the fact that uh, it was very it was almost like a formula. So all the photos, I mean, no, no offense to them, uh, great photographers, great American photographers, but um, the photos that I was seeing from the students and also you know just generally newspapers and magazines. There's almost a formula to it. Okay, so you know that the opening, the first photo is always a setting. So you have a place, and you start to introduce the character and events and things like that. And also um, the, the, the students there, so they were mainly Americans, and of course the subjects and topics that they were interested in were all within the US. And I felt that it wasn't the kind of environment that I wanted. So then I had the opportunity to go to London, a friend was studying there, so I went and I also checked out LCC and uh, I thought that it's, it's a little bit, um, it, it's a lot more open. So even though it's a photojournalism and documentary photography course, but uh, because, I guess because it's Europe, right, so there's a lot of influences, um, so and then they, yeah, it's just more diverse and I feel that there is an opportunity to explore. 
uh, photography beyond photojournalism. That's why I chose uh, and I chose uh, and I think it was a, it was it was a good decision. Uh, for me, it doesn't really matter that you know that, that I don't feel like I need to define myself whether right? I'm a documentary photographer or you know it's it's the intent um, of my work and what topics and subjects am I interested in. And I feel that for all of our works here, um, it, it all came from a social. Uh, you know, we're all talking about social issues. And even though it could be art, it could be conceptual, it could be documentary, hardcore, journalism, but you know, we're all socially concerned and it's, it's the things that we want to talk about that's more important than trying to, uh, you know, trying to categorize ourselves under a certain, certain type of a medium or, uh, you know, approach. Skip. Skip. Oh. Skip two. Skip two. <laughs> <laughs> You'll go last. <laughs> let me. Let me okay. Talk. Okay. Um, to kind of build to what Ari said, so I, I was my background is actually photojournalism. I, I, I started from newspaper background. Uh, but I, to kind of uh, repeat what Ari said, I think we should matters so much about categorizing ourselves in one box. Uh, but what I like about photojournalism, what I think is there has to be this, um, we cannot misrepresent something. And, and whether you're doing documentary art, whether you're doing documentary photography or photojournalism, you cannot present something. You can, it's, I think if you lie to your viewer, because we're, we're not talking about just Photoshop, but if you're setting something up and you you present that picture as if something that you take in as it happens, and it, you know, or whether you pay people, or whether you know, this set of ethics, you know, that you know, because for his work, for example, for how his work, I mean, it's just amazing, but uh, at the same time, he's. He's not presenting it as if it's something that is, you know, that happens in real life. Or same thing with his uh, Harry work. Uh, Harry's work. Yeah. I mean, this is how he chose to present how he feels about environment. You know. So even is is what's really bothering me now is when people are start are staging or staging their photos or you know and. Uh, in terms of photojournalism or documentary, I think if you start doing that, then you know you're, you're it's, it doesn't matter if your intention is good, but the way you execute it, if you do it, if you mislead people, if you misrepresent people, or if you are dishonest, you know, to other people, or if you steal other people's work, you know, and, and it's gonna corrupt your work. It's gonna, you know, it's, it's your foundation is really weak and it's gonna crumble. We all have good intention, we all have, we want to say something about what's happening in the world and, and we, we find different platforms, different approaches, whether it's video, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, collages or something like that. But we, I think we need to have that good foundation from the very beginning. And, and if you have a very weak foundation, it, you know, it's kind of topple. And there's been some cases of that that just happened recently, you know, where, you know, people have taught setting things up and present it as a real thing. And, you know, so, uh, I think we need more photojournalists in this world, we need more documentary photographers in this world. There's a lot of things that's happening right now. But one, one thing that separate, that, that is common with all of those different aspects of photography, we all have something to say. We're criticizing something, or I think, but, and we're, we're finding a, a, some kind of medium in order to convey that message to our audience. Um, well, I actually started from an arts background. So, yeah, I've been the arts for, for a while. And then um, I uh, was just doing photography like on the side. But my dad, he was a journalist. and. Uh, would come back with all this news like every night and it's very current and it's very fast paced and for me that's what I associate with uh, photojournalism and um, so initially, well actually Ori is my senior back in school, um, also slowly started to win thinking I could start off as a photojournalist but um, as time went along and the kind of projects and took on, I would say, are more documentary based 
but this is just my interpretation that it's much more slower and it's covered over a much more longer period of time compared to photojournalism which is like boom 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 you know like documentary is like way slow but that's how I actually perceive it um, yeah I mean yeah right you shouldn't like sort of categorize it but I think I'm more of a documentary photographer than a photojournalist yeah and um, but besides that when we're just talking about documentary photography or photojournalism or anything which you take on, I think ethics are like really important and the topics which you take on and um, you cannot be selfish, you know, you've got to put yourself in that person's position. Why are you even approaching that story in the first place? Like, who is it for? You know, why are you actually doing this? You need to ask all these questions uh, before you approach the story. How do you intend to represent the story, like, finally? Like, what do you want to do with it? I think all of these questions need to be asked and, yeah, you, you cannot be selfish and yeah, you have to have that empathy as well. So all of these things has to come into play and I think that's to me it's really, really, really important. Like um, whatever projects you take on, uh, you have a responsibility for, for it, you know? So um, that to me plays like the biggest part in every project which I actually take on. Um, for me, I consider myself as a storyteller because I think um, for me to, to tell a very, very good and powerful story is very important. And for example, actually the, the film that very inspired me and is my favorite film is Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, uh, it's, it's not about quality at all, but I feel that it's, um, it can teach every children to know how to empathy another people, how to carry the world, and how to not, you know, not surrender with the 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 order that I can control another person and the, the the value of friendship and and these things. I think it's very common things but but for me I want my work to to transfer this feeling. It's not just the information but it's just the feeling that come to your come to your body and it's grow up grow inside your body without any logical but it's just a, just the feeling of you know how do you want to liberate yourself from any power. Um, yeah, so for me, art is not, you don't want, uh, you don't have to say everything political issue, but the humanity is very important and you can say in very daily life. Um, yes. For, so for me, the, the empathy and humanity is the key of Great, great answers uh, from everyone. Uh, so if there's no further questions, uh, we will wrap the session up. They will still be around for a bit if you are shy and want to just talk to that person privately by the corner. Yeah, you know, <laughs> uh, so uh, as we wrap it up, uh, because this is our last sort of formal uh, event before Hari and Harit uh, fly back, I want to thank them very much for and uh, yeah, I look forward to more of what you do in the future. Thank you so much. And of course, thank you again to Ari, uh, Amrita, and uh, Andre as well. So thank you everyone for coming tonight.